Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Samuel Roy in support of Castaway Mountain and in conversation this evening with author Karn Mahanjan. Uh, we're also pleased to partner with the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith in presenting tonight's event. So thank you to them and welcome to uh, any of our friends joining us from the East Coast. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed this evening, uh, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase Castaway Mountain from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. Live transcription is available on your toolbar as well, should you need it. You'll also find the Q&A feature there as well. You can submit questions if you're watching live at any time, and I'll read a selection of those questions on your behalf at the conclusion of the conversation. And of course, if you're watching us later on our YouTube channel, you can find links to purchase books in the description directly below me. And you can also like and subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date with all of our events once they become available on our YouTube channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, of course, their doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, though, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon or much later in this evening, in Samia's case, or wherever uh, in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Samia Roy is a social entrepreneur, journalist, and activist based in Mumbai. She co-founded Vandana Foundation in 2016, a nonprofit that provides microloans to entrepreneurs in Mumbai. She has written for Forbes India, Outlook Magazine, The Wire, Bloomberg News, among others. While working on Castaway Mountain, Samia received fellowships from the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, Blue Mountain Center, Cary Institute for Global Good, Sangam House, and Dormar House. In 2019, she appeared on the Solvable Podcast series featuring those working to solve the world's most intractable problems. And speaking with her this evening, Karan Mahajan is the author of Family Planning, a finalist for the International Dylan Thomas Prize, the Association and the Association of Small Bonds, which was shortlisted for the 2016 National Book Award, won the 2017 NYPL Young Lions Fiction Award, and was named one of New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2016. In 2017, he was selected as one of Grant's Best Young American Novelists. His reporting and criticism have appeared in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, Vanity Fair, New Yorker Online, and other venues. He teaches at Brown University. Please join me in welcoming Samia Roy and Karim Mahajan into your living rooms. Samia, it's really wonderful to have you here today. Um, I know you're zooming in from London, where you just arrived a few days ago. So I, I hope the jet lag is working in our favor. Um, so. Uh, what we're going to do today is I'm going to just briefly uh, introduce Soumya and Soumya will read a little bit and then I'll ask her a few questions. Um, so first I just wanted to talk about my own experience of reading Castaway Mountain, um, which, which really blew me away. Um, and for one particular reason, I think, in addition to obviously the, the depth of the reporting that goes into putting together a book that recreates a world most of us don't know, which is um, this trash township essentially that exists in Bombay or Mumbai as it's now called where most of the city's trash is sent in trucks as many as 200 per hour according to Castaway Mountain uh, and um, what sets the book apart for me as I said is the memorable phrasing that goes into the book um, just the sheer stylistic uh, beauty and prowess uh, that Soumya brings to her sentences. Um, reporting it over eight years, she has, and I forgive the trash metaphor, managed to smooth the detritus of her reporting into a marvelously compressed tale of four families, and in particular a girl named Farzana who grows up in the shadow of the trash mountain and even appears at first to be addicted to the life of a rag picker before tragedy strikes. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Soumya. Thank you so much for being here and we'll hear you read. Thank you. Thank you, Karan, for being here and for doing this. I've read and admired your work for a long time and it's a pleasure to do this. 
So um, as, as you mentioned already, this is um, about the garbage mountains of Mumbai. Um, they are sort of um, at the edge of the city and they are about 122 years old, spread over 300 acres. And so typically they're called a landfill, but in this case, because it, it just filled up for so long that they've turned into mountains that are as high as 18 floor buildings, um, but that feel very much like all the cities that trash is sort of packed together with mud, rising up to make these mountains. And as you said, the book is about, um, centers a lot around Farzana and Haider Ali, her, who is her father. Um, so I will read uh, just a short section at this point. She's about, um, she's, just, she's just five and there is a plan to make a waste to energy plant, which in the end doesn't work out. But at this point, this plan is there. Um, when she was five, Haider Ali enrolled Farzana at the municipality's Urdu primary school for girls nearby. Every morning, Farzana walked to school with her sisters, Afsana and Jannat. Every afternoon, the breeze began blowing inward from the creek, bringing a whiff of the mountains into their home and drew her up the slopes. Standing on trash peaks, Farzana breathed in the sea and its unconstricted gusts as she looked out for her other sisters who worked there. Soon, the balance fell in favor of the mountains, drawing her increasingly towards them. She and her sisters spent afternoons swimming in the creek, collecting discarded cloth scraps to swell the pile their father had made on a mountain edge. Even amid the frenzied scrambles around, emptying garbage trucks, Haider Ali walked as if he moved to mellow music, playing in his ears through invisible earphones. He had heard older pickers say, no one goes, ever goes hungry here. The city's waste growing, the city's waste growing sustained them. Um, this reassurance intensified his laid back air, the music settling in him. When Haider Ali came to deliver his day's pickings of discarded cloth scraps on the pile he was accumulating on the slopes, it always looked bigger than he had left it. Farzana and the children had grown his cloth pile, helping to keep their household afloat. He couldn't keep them away from the slopes. It was Jahangir, his oldest son, who had never been to school, who fought with Haider Ali to keep his sisters away from the mountains and at school. Jahangir hungrily chased the forgotten fortunes that had eluded his father. The deeper he sank into his giddy, into this giddy mountain addiction, the more Jahangir wanted to keep his sisters away from it. He turned them back home from the slopes or to the school whose four-floor building faced the mountains, a fading foil to their sickening allure. But the sisters were back the next afternoon, trailing garbage trucks. Farzana was going to, growing to be all arms and legs, and when her sisters and what her sisters called an adha dimag, or only half a brain, the rising mountains had leaked into it, they thought. And as the peaks rose higher, the rains gushed down every monsoon, bringing the water and trash into their home. Farzana fell asleep to the clatter of rain and woke up to see her slippers floating close to her amid unknown objects that had flowed down the slopes. Blearily, she folded her salwar over her knees and waded through the water to retrieve her books and shoes, drifting through neighboring homes. Then she walked up the squelching slopes, away from school. She and her sisters dragged reeking wooden planks that Jahangir and their brother Alamgir, the third of the nine children, nailed to the walls as bunk beds at home and piled their soaking household on. At night, they clambered on to sleep on the planks amid their belongings while trash-filled waters sloshed below. When the rains burst, Farzana helped her mother throw out the garbage and bring their damp provisions and trash they had stored and that had turned to mush out to catch the sun, peeking in their slim lane. She brought out her water-stained notebooks. Everything she had learned had blurred. Trying to catch up was futile. Her friend Yasmin, who was a few years older and lived down the lane, would say, Farzana's mind was filled with mush anyway. Thank you so much, Samia. I, I just want to compliment you again on some of the phrases here. You know, everything she learned had blurred. Um, giddy mountain addiction, a fading foil to their sickening allure. Um, so, you know, as I was reading and I was struck by this uh, amazing phrase making and the lack of cliche, I was also thinking about your background, right? Which is that you were first a journalist, then you ran uh, essentially an NGO to provide micro loans um, to the underprivileged and poor in Mumbai. 
uh, and then you got into writing this book. I'm curious why it took the form of a, na- of a sort of narrative nonfiction account as opposed to a more, you know, a series of magazine articles or let's say uh, something that was closer to a kind of technocratic report because I'm sure that's also in your wheelhouse as something someone who's written for Forbes India and so on. So I want to hear about that. Sure. Um, you're right. Um, I, I had, you know, when I was a journalist, as you know, a common friend, Manu, Joseph and I, um, we worked together at Outlook magazine and we wrote, he and I, we wrote about all kinds of things from, um, we were, worked in the Bombay Bureau. And so we worked on, wrote about Bollywood and stock markets and political scams and the works. And as you know, I mean, he went on to write novels, although he does write nonfiction. And then um, I um, started this nonprofit because I used to write on financial inclusion later, even for other magazines. And so I worked on microfinance and you know, running a nonprofit is something I have no experience with. So it was like writing just drained out of my mind completely. And you had to learn how to actually run a business and how to um, you know, manage people or uh, you know, give loans, get loans back. Um, and then in 2013, we began getting waste pickers from there and I was immediately struck by them because while they were earning money, it was like this place was on their person. Um, They had cuts, they had bruises, they had bent legs. And so I began asking them. And at first they brought photographs to show me. And then they brought like on their phone videos. And then I began following them back. Um, And, you know, just curious to see what was this place, et cetera. And in 2016, there were fires there uh, in Deunar and which threw up massive amounts of smoke and fire and stuff like that. And so I, thought I would write a magazine piece because waste speakers were getting detained for having lit these fires. But I actually thought that we had, whether or not they lit them, that we had a connection with this place that we had made this combustible place. So that I would write a magazine piece about what waste pickers' lives were. But you're right in that, you know, I began researching it and there were so many strands that came out um, in terms of the structural things that happen that keep these mountains in place, that keep these lives in place, that make this unmoving imprint on their life, um, that, that also had to be documented. And you're right in saying that, you know, when you, my entry point was the waste pickers and their lives, and they really had such outsized personalities that I would say that they just came through. Uh, it, it, it couldn't have been a technocratic piece because their personalities were just their sense, their gumption, their spirit. Like they never said that this was an awful place or that they, they lived in, in this policy failure, really, in this gap of policy, in this shadow of, of the India that we sometimes see that is glimmering and that is shining, but that they are living in its armpit. They thought they were living in a that that, that amazing lives could be made of this trash, that they had seen gold, they had seen um, spirits, they had seen diamond dust, and that somebody had made an amazing life of this. And so I thought that there was this play of light and darkness and their personality is bringing light to this place that very naturally came through. You couldn't not have it. That's a beautiful answer. Um, but I'm going to follow that up with uh, a question about, you know, just the difficulty of the kind of journalism that you do, which is that in 2013, I think you say in the book, you first started going to the owner, right, by, by, while extending loans, essentially, to some of the waste pickers for their smaller businesses that they were running from the owner. And you went to basically see what was going on on the ground, or the loans going to go bad. And you really only started reporting it as a book maybe in 2016 is that correct so what were you um what kind of note taking and observation were you doing from 2013 to 2016 was it and how did you go back and reconstruct that period because the book actually I think the section you just read is from like 2008 or something right so it even goes further back and it's very narrative so I'm just I'd love to hear about the process of uh, reconstructing that Sure, sure. So, I mean, when I, in that period when I went uh, from 13 to 16, there was very little note taking. Um, it was more just let's walk the mountains. Um, so I remember Vita by this character through whom I reconstruct the history of this place. She, her son, her grandson, they would just walk me. So it was this very visceral experience like, oh my God, like what, what is beneath my feet? What is around me? So just noticing those kinds of things. So really in 16, I also went back then and began writing again in notebooks just to make sure. So everything has been done 
almost twice or thrice to make sure that um, what they said in conversation is what I had heard and then actually write it down. And, um, uh, and then also the documentary part of the research because there were, I would just go down many of these research rabbit holes of the court case. Um, and it seemed like something would happen in the court case. So I began going to court and then ended up spending hundreds of hours in court where really nothing happened. Now, or like archival research. So that was the documentary aspect of the research. But yes, even with this, there were many things that they had told me that I must tell you I had disregarded. Um, like you, it could be like, say, mm, uh, that they saw spirits. And I thought when I was giving in my capacity of somebody giving loans to them, I thought like, this is, this is, I shouldn't be getting <laughs> this, <laughs> right? Um, but then later when you're writing a story and you're wanting to ask them, so isn't this awful? Isn't this place awful? They're not saying it's awful, right? It's a child's childhood. So they'll say, no, it's fantastic. But you know, by the way, in my house, there was a spirit that was floating there. Um, so you at some point you realize that it's, it's your shortcoming as a, you know, a writer and a journalist, when we expect that very neatly articulated answer, yeah, yeah, it stinks, yeah, yeah, it's awful. If it's coming in different ways and we just have to be receptive for it to come in those ways. So many times in my notebooks, I have written, um, you know, lots of things that in the end didn't add up or that did add up in ways that I didn't expect. When I would come back and I would write, I was like, did this person really say this? <laughs> no, that could not be. So then I would go back and report it a second time. Or So it's like, you know, everything was done several times over, I would say. Wow. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a wonderful point also about the, you know, the shaitans and the, the jinns and all the other things that the, the citizens of, of this trash dump report seeing, right? that you make them into features of the narrative. There's a magic realist quality almost, which means that it's inflected with their way of seeing. So at what point did you realize that those spirits would play such a, it's one thing to obviously note them down in your notebook and realize you'd missed it, but how, what stage did those become like a through line that almost holds the book together? And maybe you can talk a tiny bit for the audience about what, in what way they hold the book together as well. Sure. I mean, as I said, at first for, for years, I disregarded it because I just thought like this was this was beyond my purview as a lender, then even as a writer, because we naturally come, a play from, come from a place of rationalism or reason or, you know, whatever that might mean. So, um, I mean, and then when the fires happened and there was a lot happening, you know, you know, they were going through a lot of trauma and sometimes they would say, you know, oh, the cubby is, you know, possessed um, and Farzana and a lot of things happened with, with her. Um, it could, and I began writing those sections. Um, those sections were really polished during the lockdown. And so they were, they were not very, you know, easy. Uh, but my intention was there were fires at the time. So it could be that a lot of stuff that they were inhaling. So I do have the whole scientific mm. explanation of all the different chemicals that landfills uh, emit. And that does impact your mental uh, growth and, you know, uh, cognitive abilities for children. Um, so maybe they're growing up with intergenerational, intergenerational malnutrition. It could be plastic pollution, like millions of tons of plastic is burning on those mountains. So there's, there's a doctor, they take her to a doctor and he says, yeah, she's just weak and she needs you know, medicines for anemia. So it could very well be that. But then when they were telling me that it was the spirits, then you couldn't disregard that. And I felt that as a journalist, you just had to have that, the multiple, the possibilities of multiple truths, that they had to be given equal weightage without my being condescending towards one or the other. Leave that possibility that all this poverty, all this marginalization is something beyond anybody's comprehension. And it's possible that they're articulating it in this way. And we mm. just have to leave room, have some respect for how, just leave room at least for them to articulate it in the way that they can understand, which is to rely on the ancient myths that they know. They don't know maybe about hydrogen sulfide and methane and what it does to your mind and all of those things. But and poverty also means that they have to keep working through fires, through smoke, all of that. But maybe this is the only way in which they can articulate it. And doing that, that ritual of like something, you know, whatever, whether it's burning chilies or something, is exorcising it and they mm. can keep working. So we just, I, I felt like I just had to be, as a writer, just give them the equal space. 
if this yeah. story was about waste pickers, then you had to give them the space to tell their narrative also. And how did you land upon the decision to excise the I from the narration? Uh, because that's that's a striking feature. It's kind of bookended by a very short section, which which is from your perspective, and a, another very short section at the end. But um, in the middle, there's again this feel of yeah, a documentary where you're watching these lives unfold very gradually. That was one thing I really appreciated about the book was how it didn't try to adhere to a false three act structure. It had a kind of feeling of seasons of life on this place. Things gradually starting, stopping again, the same with the court case. But yeah, I, I wonder, this is maybe it's a two pronged question. One is how did you excise or why did you excise the I, which can be a kind of filter, right? You can then be present saying, well, they're saying this thing about jinns or about shaitans or about khabis. Like, do I khabis? Do I believe it? Or, and then the second, and the second part of this question would essentially be the one of you know how to decide to tell the story as one of seasons or one of years passing on the same spot. Yeah. And so so um the decision the decision to write it in not so much in first person i think as journalists naturally we tend not to write in first person and um almost uncomfortable not to write in first person i feel um so i i at first wrote it not in first person when the book but it's a very unusual book in that it's written in both voices when the book was acquired in the uk and for india uh, my editor said this is great but you need to be in it um so that edition does have a little bit of me in it because she felt that my insight would be valuable um so not much but it does have it is written with with some eye mm. um, and then when the book was acquired in the us my editor said, my editor said this is great but you should not be in it <laughs> So I then went back and exercised myself from, like, took myself out of it. Um, so it's there in the introduction and the end. And I feel that I hope the reader carries that with them. So even when you don't say that you're I, they do know that it's you who's seeing it and my own relationships and um, everything with the, with the uh, subjects is there. It's not like, you know, this is the unalienable truth. This is as I see it. And hopefully the reader is you know, it's carrying that with them. So yeah, I mean, I don't have the right answer on whether I should be there or I should not be there because I've done both. Um, and this is an unusual book in that sense. Um, sorry, um, your, the other question you were asking me was? Well, oh, the second one was about the overall structuring of the book, which oh, yeah. is, is a sort of like, you know, gradual charting yeah. of the court case and of these lives, like not, not forcing, not sort of, compressing it into one dramatic situation, for example. Yeah, I think that uh, at for, it, it could have been that way if we, if we, like basically I wanted to show the connection between policy lurching and it's a direct connection with their life on the on these people and particularly with Farsama. And so you when when nothing happens in terms of policy, how do we expect this resolution for these people? So just the way there are these unending cycles of this, oh, something might happen, something might happen, something might happen, but then in the end it doesn't happen. With their life also, there is this hope. There's so many times when they say, oh, he was going to get a job and in this plant that was going to come and they thought it would get better, it would get better, but then it didn't. And then they plan to make a compost plant and they plan to make a waste energy plant and now they're making a smaller plant but it's not coming so then I actually wanted to show the stuckness of this being in this place that nobody really leaves the only person I think in this whole book who's left is one who disappeared and one who's in jail so it is about social mobility which I think your book is also about yeah no I found that I mean I, I thought the depictions of the the court um hearings were harrowing for that reason. I mean, it reminded me a little of the movie Court, which I'm sure you've yeah. seen by Chaitanya Tamhane, but also of the experience anyone has in an Indian court, but on a much larger scale, right? Um, so I had, a, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one question at first about the, the court hearings, which as you said, one of the things they want to do is set up this waste to energy plant, which at one at first it's one plant, then it's three plants, then it's going to be the biggest plant ever in the world. <laughs> Maybe a Chinese company is going to do it. But my question is just a purely um, curious one, which is, could that actually ever work given the kind of trash that is being generated? Yeah. In this um, and in what ways would it work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, could it work? Yes. Um, 
they already have made some sort of a plant in Kanjurmarg, uh, which um, much of Bombay's waste goes there. Here they are now planning a smaller plant. Um, is it possible that it'll work? There are a lot of challenges, right? But I am also I also question a little bit this idea of just a technocratic solution to these problems, right? Um, I mean, there are many reasons why it hasn't worked so far. And is it possible that it could work? I certainly wouldn't be the one to say that, oh, it's just not going to work. I don't, you know, I hope it does. All I can say is I hope it does. Um, but uh, they say that Bombay trash is very soggy, but also that, that, that this technocratic solution, right? That in, let's say it's an incinerator, that, oh my God, we are going to keep producing trash and then it's all going to turn into like 1% as just ash which will then be made into bricks so like our waste has vanished right so that 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 mindset of just a technocratic solution for our lives is is maybe a little bit of an ephemeral thought in the first place and i also feel that any solution would have to include those people who who are the only ones who took anything away from here whereas even the plant that they plan, plan that they have now says that nobody lives here nobody lives off here and so no compensation is required and this can go on they, they can just make a brick and mortar solution to this whole thing but actually if you see i obtained papers for the court paper, court case for 26 years um even the simplest things like for 26 years the judge is saying is there a boundary wall is there a boundary <laughs> wall there is no boundary wall is there a, is there a camera is there a camera is there a camera there is no camera is there a is there a light in this 300 acres for the longest time there were hardly any lights so i mean to your question that is there going to be a power plant that will work yeah sure i do hope so but that doesn't take away from the blight of all of these years so <laughs> anyway Right, right. And that um, leads me to a question um, about, you know, the lives of the waste pickers, of course, which uh, this is why I would encourage everyone to read this book. It, this is a very eloquent depiction of those lives. But when you intersected with those lives at very difficult moments, right, this is the classic journalistic dilemma. You know, there's a part where one of the characters, I won't name for the sake of suspense, is very badly hurt. There's um, yes, Yasmin uh, is a character who goes through all kinds of medic goes to medical trials to make money. You know, people are people are are basically taking on fairly dangerous jobs or medical procedures. Did you intervene in any way in those situations, especially since you had a history of intervention as a lender, or how did you balance that? No, I didn't. It was very difficult for me. It was very difficult for me. Uh, in 2016, when I thought I would I would write something, I told them. I actually, the people who are the character who are in the book now, I actually told them that okay. So at this point, like what I'm speaking to you not for a loan, but I'm going to write something. I don't know. It could be a magazine piece. It could be a book or something. But it's you know, there's This is not for money. We're not going to be paying you. We just you just want to talk. And there's this character called Salma, and she was like, great. You're going to need a video. Like what? What are you writing in your book? Our lives are such. You need like. Like a movie about our lives so so yeah most of almost all of them there was just this one person who i wanted to write about who said you know i'm sure there's some money aspect behind this i don't get involved whatever so he didn't want to for whatever reason he didn't want to and that was the only character who dropped out but it was very clear to them that this was just about information this was not about like you know this was going to be something written about um so they knew and at that point onwards every day was a difficult day in this sense when I was reporting there were so many instances like especially I felt it I'll tell you when with Yasmin who you talk about her husband abandoned her and she had young children in the house and I've spent months in their house where there's a 12 year old daughter who's very beautiful an eight year old daughter who's stum stammering and stuttering who I felt a lot of the trauma came out through and I was spending a lot of afternoons with them and they would just be like doing some embroidery to earn enough to get their meal at the end of the day. And I had come from my house having had lunch or breakfast or whatever. So I would try to bring biscuits for them or something and they would say, like, you know, we'll, when we earn some money, then we'll, you know, we're really not hungry. Uh, and through them, it was the fragility, both in terms of nutrition, but also a young girl living alone. Um, there were so many points at which, um, I was tempted, but I knew that at least at this point, this was kind of this, this 
intervening wouldn't really um, work. So apart from small things like buying a meal or buying baby clothes sometimes, something I didn't. Um, but that, I, I must tell you, at some point it became a little frustrating for them. Like, when is this book coming out? Like, you know, yeah. And now that it is out, it has smoothened my relationship with them a lot, I think. It has, I'm sorry, I missed the last part. It has improved it your has relationship with them? Smoothened my relationship. <laughs> oh, yes, smoothened it. Yeah, they know something. And have they, have they been able to like, I, I know some of them are illiterate, but have some of them been able to listen to it or to read parts of the book in Hindi? Has it come out in Hindi oh. or Urdu or... No, I have given them the English book, talk them through it. So okay. some of the children read and they try to read and they do explain to the parents. But I think by now they've been through so many rounds of what is in the book. They, they, they're just like tired and they're fed up. They know who's in it, who's not in it, who's this minor character in it. They sometimes watch these videos that we do. They'll go on LinkedIn or something and they like, you know, when they are mentioned there. So they certainly participated. They've made videos, they've shared photographs. Many of them made videos, like Farzana made a video saying, yeah, mere mein, this is about me, I'm Farzana. So, you know, this is all true. This is my story. So they want to participate in their own way. And then they don't, they don't want to, probably be speaking publicly but by in their own way they do want to participate and they do that's great and i i want to hear about the actual since you had brought it up you know the experience of being in a place like this you know i've uh, most of us have not spent eight years uh, reporting on you know what is essentially like a very toxic site right um what was the experience of getting acculturated to that? Like, was there, a, how long did it take before you stopped, let's say, noticing the smells and you had gotten so used to it? Or when you were no longer worried about catching a disease yourself, if you were eating with people? I'm just curious because clearly yeah. there's a moment where you go from being an outsider to an insider during those eight years. So yeah, I mean, if you ask me, I feel it doesn't smell too much. There's, there is some effort that goes into it. They do pack in some mud along with the garbage and there's crores of rupees spent on spraying disinfectant and deodorant, so it doesn't smell. Um, so it didn't smell tremendously. Even in my very first visit, I remember looking at it like, hmm. like a, not an archeological find, but really like just complete um, fascination. I remember like all the things we were like packed uh, packets of like say cereal and grain uh, sacks and everything you just look down at that mountain and like everything is there like children's shoes to like um foil boxes of food styrofoam cups of coffee like jewelry clothes everything is mushed up or like making that mountain so that curiosity was like i, I would say it was always there and i think that sometimes or if you could say that it's also curiosity but when you're talking to sources you want them to talk to you so i don't know karen if you've experienced this but like if you go to somebody's office and you want them to talk to you and they offer you like milky tea you never say no Right. <laughs> Whether right. or not you have it. In the same way, this is the way like relationships work. When they say, aren't you going to have lunch? You never say no. So I certainly didn't stay there. I cannot say that, oh, this is my life or I live there. Or, I'm not saying that. But yes, did I eat there? Yes, absolutely. Do I like, um, have I had fights and arguments with them? Yes. Have we had very warm, lovely <laughs> long afternoons of like, um, you know, and that is how also some of the really nice, um, you know, earlier you were talking about it, some very wonderful memories also get, you know, intermingled with some very painful memories. So then they'll tell you how they ate hotel breakfast arrived there and they ate it and they, they did remember they had love, the humor and the joy and the love. It comes from them. Like they, they don't remember it as an awful place. They'll tell you, yeah, there was time Daru party tha. We had an alcohol party on the garbage mountains with the leftover alcohol that came in the garbage. So the, those were the memories and suddenly in the middle of that they would say and then two days later you know my uh, whatever my daughter got sick or like oh yeah that time my foot came under the garbage mountain so it's all intermingled over that long afternoon of tea and food and scribbling in them scribbling in your notebook you scribbling in their notebook and all these stories just come out in that messy way no and I think that's why it has such a novelistic feel this mingling of of joy and and sadness right that um you know, as you said, you have many wonderful scenes of celebration, some very funny scenes, like when, when a man is, uh, is, thinks that a drone is watching him pee because there's feelings that, you know, that the government is encroaching. So that, that was really well done. And it also struck me, this is um, in many ways, just a great Bombay book, right? Like 
uh, you mentioned how you can see the kind of deep archaeology of the city right in front of you, ex- everything, the flip side of everything that's happening in, in Mumbai. Um, and I had read an interview online where you talk about sort of some of your favorite Bombay books. Sorry, I keep saying Bombay. It's just an old, yeah. old habit. But, um, you know, you talk about you talked about Kiran Nagarkar's Ravan and Eddie, which is a wonderful book, or Jerry Pinto's book, which is fantastic, Manu Joseph's work. Um, and one natural question I have for you is that when you set out to write a book like this, you also have looming over your project, Catherine Boo's book, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, which is, is, a, is, a, is another great book. And it's an, about a very different place. It's about a slum near the airport. It's not about this. But I'm sure that at some point this must have come up in when you're writing it, people are comparing it or when you're selling it. And I, I wonder like what have, having this one successful book in the background on the same, on a similar subject, what that did to change the way you were approaching it, or if it was just not a book that affected you very much, or yeah, just curious to hear. Yeah, no, it didn't. I must say like, I, at first when I thought of writing this book, somehow it didn't strike me, <laughs> maybe because I had left journalism. So I, uh, you know, I, I was interested in this place. I began writing it. And I would say halfway through, people began telling me stuff like, you're like, yeah, and you remember that book? And I was like, oh my God, I do know that book. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. uh, and so I actually um, obviously had read um, Catherine Boo's work over many um, years when I was a journalist and I was a journalism student even, and really read and admired her work. Um, the Marriage Cure, this beautiful piece that she wrote for, I think, New Yorker magazine that won a National Magazine Award, um, obviously Beyond the Beautiful Forevers. But then um, I, at that point, I had left journalism. When I came back, I mean, this comes very deeply from my own experience. I didn't write it to be like that or not to be like that. And when I realized that was also my I was like, okay, this was also my plan, like that it should be true to the characters that I see and they have such wonderful personalities that it should be true to their life, to what they're seeing, what they're going through, rather than for it to be like something or not like something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great answer. And speaking of the characters, you know, Farzana, who you read about is, is one of the major characters in the book, the major character, perhaps. And in your introduction and your, sorry, in your acknowledgments, I was really struck by something you say, which is that at some point when you're shape, shaping the book, um, you, were, you were discussing it with your friend Geeta Anand, who in some ways remotely mediated between Farzana <laughs> and me so that Farzana could say the things she could not bear to, and I could ask about them, hear them, and write about them. I wanted to just unpack that. I could, I'm not sure if you meant that metaphorically or there was an actual media, actual times Geeta was talking to Farzana. I just want to hear <laughs> about what that meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. No, so this, um, Farzan, I mean, I had known her since she was about 13 or 14 years old, but we used to lend to her father and she would come over to our office sometimes with him. But I had known him as his teenage daughter. Um, so I had chatted with her, but I certainly didn't think that, you know, things would unfold in the way that they did. And so in 2016, when it became clear to me that there was a lot happening with Farzana, then I'm, I mean, I wrote drafts of it with all the characters. All the characters in the book are equally reported. Um, and then I remember there they was a crazy, messy draft, like many writers find themselves God, having. Nightmares. Yeah, yeah, I know. Exactly. I'm aware. And at that point, I think my friend Gita just stepped in. And so one or two people, I think maybe Manu may have read it at that point and said, like, what are you doing? Farzana is it. Like, she needs to be the main person in this book. Uh, and so when I thought it was a magazine piece, actually, I thought it would be about Vita Bhai and Salma, the two old grand dames of this place. Mm. Uh, then at some point in 16, when I started thinking of writing this book, Mohara Mali disappeared. And I thought this was all about him. Uh, and then, you know, I thought I realized, I mean, I knew somewhere, but Gita was like, Sonia, this is about Farzana. And so I must say that because of the trauma that she went through, I avoided asking her, like, oh, how did you feel? You know, didn't, didn't, didn't you want to cry? Like, what, what was it like? It, I didn't have, I, I would say the maybe the vocabulary to deal with it and, and she didn't want to talk about it. So we went through months of me watching like big grade movies in her house, not saying anything. <laughs> then, you know, once I, I twice, I think I, I took Kulfi, I was half my way to her house and she said, no, you keep asking me the same things. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so I would go back home uh, and she was like, I don't, don't you want to talk to me about something else? So I, um, and Gita just would tell me something and I was very frustrated and Gita would just say, no, 
for me, just keep going. And so I think she just kept me going through that difficult phase. And eventually then Farzana just realized, and you know, we just started going out to shrines, which are the scenes depicted later in the book. So we began visiting shrines, we began visiting hospitals when she needed to go, et cetera. And sometimes in the most unexpected way, she would say, do you remember that day I could hear everything. I never, I was conscious the whole time. Uh, I wore this, I ate this that morning. You know, all that, that it became then a way for her to articulate the things that had been there in her the whole time, but that nobody had asked her and that she had not spoken about. Well, it's a, it's a real testament to the depth of your reporting. I think that, you know, that answer, were you, were you, so you were present even for the times that she got injured and was in the yeah. hospital? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, I did yeah. visit her. I, but obviously, you don't go to an injured person and say, "So, how did you feel?" Right. You know, you just right. want to be sensitive around that. So it took many months, but in the end, she she would just see it at the most unexpected times, and then I would be scrambling, take out my notebook, and she would be like, "Do you know what I was seeing at that point of time? My eyes were open, I could see everything, and it became this weirdly cathartic experience for her." Hmm. So I'll ask you one uh, more question, and then we'll go to the Q and A, and we can always come back if if uh, if we have if we have more time. Uh, which is um, in your reading, right, and also in my reading of the book, I was struck by how all the dialogue is first presented in Marathi or Hindi or you know uh, Urdu or whatever it might be at the time, and then translated into English, which stands out to any Indian writer, right? Because this is a classic <laughs> thing that all of us. Indian writers in English struggle with is how do you represent dialogue accurately? How do you represent even lives accurately when they're not lived in English? So yeah. how um with that dialogue did it did was that the natural form in which it emerged? How how did you get to the get to that particular format for representing dialogue? Yeah, we we tried different things. Like if you see the UK edition of the book, we we use dialogue a little less. There is less direct speech and it's used in a slightly more flowy way. Languages are flowing into each other a little more. Whereas here, we, I did use more direct speech because the quotes, I feel the quotes that I've used, they're just irrepressible. Like, there is no replacement for that. Like, you know, the stink of the mountains had burnt my hair right in childhood. Um, you know, it, there was no replacement. Khadi hume bulati thi. Like they had, it was almost like a love affair with the Kabish mountains, that addiction. Um, so I used it, I think, somewhat sparingly. But really, where I could not, I didn't, I couldn't mediate. What could I say that could better this? Mm. Or mm. what could, you know, paraphrasing would just take away that gem like quality of it where they were speaking and that emotion was coming out through themselves, that character, that person, their relationship with this place was coming out so beautifully that I could not mediate. And, you know, it would just make it seem sanit sanitized and anodyne. Like I'm sure authors like you, you had some beautiful quotes in this, like the Delhi quotes <laughs> uh, that, that were just like, I thought your book was just such an amazing Delhi book for that matter, because it's also the, the Delhi that I grew up in. I went to college there, I went to school there and lived there and all the markets and to think such crazy, extraordinary things were happening behind these very mundane places and they did but it's just when you go through it you don't feel it right 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 no absolutely um well so i think i'll pass it on to john now uh because john is going to read out questions from the audience um and then I we can, can come back if, already. yeah i can see yeah, one we, already. we have one question so far and uh yeah if, if folks want to continue to submit their questions if you have any for samia you can do so using the q a but I'll, I'll ask this first question and if we we don't have any additional questions we can turn it back to karen for any last questions um but tracy writes um what is your next project going to be so first of all thank you for coming tracy it's lovely <laughs> to see you here um so yeah, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I'm. This project was a multi-year project. Um, it leaving me has been a little difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have any a, a whole book project planned. Um, I am just writing um, journalistic pieces um, from my research that are related to the book, but I don't have a whole book planned um, at this point. 
and I'm kind of hoping from I'm not sure that I, I, I will sort of you know do one soon at least. Thank you. Um Karn, I'm happy to turn it back over to you if you if you have additional Yeah, I can I can take it over and then sure. I'll take a, I'll keep an eye on the chat if other yeah, people that... ask questions if it and then we can um you know I can ask the question to Somya. Okay, absolutely. Uh, great. Somya, that actually um segues nicely into the question I had for you, which is did are you tempted now or do you are you returning now to the world of um NGOs? Like what what was your I mean, looking back now that you've been out of that world for a few years, what was that experience like? Did it leave you disillusioned? Did it leave you inspired? Uh, yeah, I just want to hear about it. Um, not, not disillusioned, um, but 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 inspired because you just meet like such amazing, interesting people, and you get a sense of um, um, the fragility of the lives of the poor, which you see in this book also. So this book, I think, has a lot of my learnings from that, that period, certainly. Um, some of it is, like I would say, a little bit is our hubris as microfinance lenders, where we feel that if we're giving a small loan, that that person's life should completely transform. But that actually, this, as you see in this book, like one health disaster, and you know that just pulls you down again, and or like um, some police case, which people like this often get caught in, and all your savings are gone. And so the lives of the poor are so fragile that breaking out of that cycle of poverty really takes more than just a loan, although a loan is certainly helpful. Um, so I'm like, just these are just some of the crazy characters that I met. Um, you get to see people's dreams. The money also gives you a sense of people's dreams, their aspirations, and how they're so similar across um, um, uh, economic backgrounds. Even as you know, this period in our economy, we were seeing like just tremendous amount of aspiration coming out in different forms. Mm -hmm some of it resulting in crime. Like it's the edge of human experience, right? Live on a landfill or I, in some ways Bombay City as well, right? You know, which you also talk about in Delhi um, in your book so beautifully. So yeah, I mean, you do get to see human character in very interesting and different ways. It didn't leave me illusioned. It left me extremely inspired. But you don't want to go back into uh, NGO work? Are you going to continue doing it as well, alongside writing? Yeah, alongside writing, yes. Oh, you are going to. Okay, great, great. I wasn't sure if that, if that was something that you had done and had, had left behind. Great, that's good to know. Um, and then, yeah, I wanted to ask you this question when I wish I'd come across from another interview you'd done where you said that you had um, just reread Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath when you were beginning to either report or write this and that you were also uh, interested in the nonfiction newspaper series that he had drawn mm -hmm. on, Harvest Gypsies, and Working Days, the diary he kept through the writing. Did you try to recreate that kind of uh, triumvirate of sources? Like, in what ways did that uh, speak to your particular writing style? Yeah, no, so I would say the first thing was the diaries, just to see him like some, I had read Drapes of Froth as a kid, I think, um, or I, probably when I was in high school or college or something. Uh, so reading the diaries was very inspiring, just more than anything to know that a person like that struggles every day, that, you know, you feel he, he writes a lot about his sense of limitation. Is he going to get done? Is this going to be any good? And when you know that this was such an amazing book, then you do feel like, I mean, weirdly inspired to keep going because he also had this quota of words he wanted to write every day, um, that he wanted to sit on his desk, every, you know, just every day and get through it. And sometimes it's that is what keeps you going that you do. Like he goes through lots of self-doubt, um, which I, I'm sure as writers or maybe all of us do, I certainly do. Um, you know, and that there is some merit to just keep going back and polishing and repolishing and enjoying that process. So that I found his diaries extremely helpful in that sense. Um, Grapes of Wrath and Harvest Gypsies. It, I mean, I, I wish you, you know, I, if you could also talk about what your experience has been working in fiction and nonfiction, which is basically Harvest Gypsies is the nonfiction version. When, when these migrant workers began coming into California, he first wrote a newspaper series which was later called Harvest Gypsies, where he is talking about very similar kind of dialogue, um, similar kind of like characters, but these are real life characters. So you get a sense. And then in Harvest, in uh, Grapes of Froth, of course, they are 
more fictionalized but how characters are created how dialogue is used to create those characters um and so many you see the limitations of non fiction and the scale of fiction the scale that fiction allows you to have so just see reading them both i won't be able to say in a concrete sense how it helped me because this is what i was dealing with was you know i have my own reporting and research but sometimes you stuck you read something and certainly that helps yeah that makes complete sense um and then i want to um since you since you brought up uh, you know this question for me about drafting uh, you know my experience my experience is the same as yours it's a it's a horrible endless process of going back things get better sometimes things get worse so on and so forth but um a natural question i had for you is that this book ends right before covid starts right it ends with the the ca citizen citizenship amendment act in 2019 which narendra modi tried to pass potentially disenfranchising millions of muslims um and so and then pretty much soon after that by march 2020 we have covid so one question is what was the experience like of being sequestered with your material after all this time out and about um did you go back even during covid um if so what was that like and the second question is of course what effect did covid have on the lives of people there because obviously that's out of the scope of the time frame of the book but i'm just curious to hear yeah yeah no um so uh, yeah i have a related question for you related to that um so so yeah a uh, covid certainly at first um there was a complete at bombay i think was the city with a very severe lockdown um so they were at first there was a high incidence of covid in this ward i did do a story for the wire india on that um but these are poor people they can't they work on a daily basis they can't afford not to work because they'll just go hungry and so many of them did say for that story that you know ko bimari nahi to bhook kha jayegi like you know will die of hunger if not um uh, illness and so um there was actually there was waste coming to the garbage dumping grounds and for a while they couldn't work but as soon as they could sneak in they did uh, and so many of them were also handling uh, covid related waste um so it may not be directly as you know it doesn't spread from surfaces so much but they were certainly handling covid um you know a hospital waste um it could just be like saline bags food trays bottles so they were they, it was an opportunity for them as everything is an opportunity for them they did work through it many of them worked through it they were when the monsoons came they were ppe kits and worked through the rain uh, in the garbage dump so they worked through it all uh, as much as they could like the early months were pretty severe what was it like for me uh, at first i was not going later i was going a little bit um so for the first time i did phone interviews and finally that was that also went out went off very well because they, they were not distracted by so many you know these mm. kinds of cast, there's a cast moving cast of characters like children and grandparents and all kinds of people coming going so but on the phone sometimes late at night i would call up mm. and many things that they would not feel comfortable to say in person they would see on the phone which came as a surprise to me hmm um so there were a few times i sent food out for them because they really were in very dire straits and so i mean after they would eat in the night we would talk um and they would remember a lot of things like things like this possession which they are sometimes a little embarrassed to talk about because there is a version of islam which is which includes this which is not very um you know by the book islam <laughs> but but at night when they would just eat in a meal after two days or something then they would say uh, you know this had happened to me also or you know where all did we take farzana for her rituals or something that they would otherwise be ashamed to say in person they felt comfortable to say um you know in on the phone sometimes that is super interesting um i think unfortunately we are at 755 which is when we are we are supposed to stop otherwise i could keep going and and interrogating somia about her process and about this amazing book um but yeah thank you so much somia it was it was wonderful chatting i hope we i hope in a well post covid world isn't going to happen anytime <laughs> soon but we'll hopefully we'll get to meet regardless Yeah no this was a complete pleasure i actually was reading this book and it was your book this morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a complete pleasure and i have a line that i wanted to read out for you oh, that's very sweet um
Okay. So I know you just became a father and there is a line that I thought that I wanted to read for you, which is basically, there was a change in him after Tushar was born. Vikas loved the boy in the obsessive cuddly way he loved animals, constantly nuzzling against him, singing wicked demented songs. He was energized as many artists are by his own creation. <laughs> yeah, I just became a father. This is this is actually fairly <laughs> accurate to how, how I'm behaving. So, so I'm glad I, I captured you, it before I had a kid. <laughs> no, but I wish you this great spot of creativity and energy, <laughs> much like your character. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to both of you so much, Samia Roy, Karma Hajan, for joining us this evening on At Home with Literati. And, and thanks to our partners at the Transnational Literature Series at Bookland Booksmith as well for making tonight possible. Uh, we hope to have you both uh, in the store, uh, however that can become possible <laughs> in the coming years, um, knock on wood. Um, but until then, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our uh, viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you, you John. Thank you, Samia. Bye. Thank Take you, care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.